So that there are some inherent challenges in neuroendocrine tumors in, in identifying the primary site sometimes uh, and just diagnosing uh, this type of tumor. We also know that for neuroendocrine tumors, there are some specialized diagnostic imaging tests uh, that are available. Uh, one of those is somatostatin receptor scintigraphy or octreotide scan. Uh, let me ask uh, Pam, do you tend to use octreotide scans in, in your patients, either for diagnosis or for follow-up? So, you know, so Matt, I normally start with cross-sectional imaging, and I would probably start with a multiphasic contrast CT or an MRI um, to really get a good sense of where the tumors are located, um, particularly in patients with metastatic disease. You know, I think I tell most of my patients that they need an octreotide scan at least once. Um, I think that's because as we're learning a little bit more about novel therapeutics that may target patients who have octreotide positive disease, that's important. Um, I don't use it to follow patients for, sur sur for their surveillance. I will continue using cross-sectional imaging. But I think that sometimes if a unique question comes up, so for example, I recently had a patient who had a new lesion in the femoral head, and she hadn't had evidence of bony disease, so I used an octreotide scan to really help distinguish that, and her primary was positive, and her, that bone lesion was positive. So to answer a specific question, I might use that as well. James, do you use octreotide scans routinely in, in your practice? Yeah, I agree with Pam. I do it at least once, and maybe at key points, like when a patient has a recurrence or something like that. Other than that, I use it mostly to sort out specific questions, like uh, whether a recurrence has occurred, a slightly enlarged lymph node, whether they're involved with tumor. And occasionally, if I'm thinking about sending some patients for a PRT or some other treatment based on that. So it's, I not uncommonly see patients who uh, may have metastatic neuroendocrine tumor and nobody can find the primary site. And they go through untold number of diagnostic tests, octreotide scan, capsule endoscopy. Do you think those sorts of tests are necessary or would you just kind of take a step back and let things be? You know, I think uh, I, I will take at least one good look and, uh, but, uh, and do the test and see whether we find anything. Uh, but if, if we don't find it, uh, based on what we do, I don't think keep doing them necessarily is going to be that helpful. So things we sometimes will do is like, a, you know, a CT scan designed for the small bowel with negative bowel contrast. And I think octreo scan one, see if they have suggestive symptoms is reasonable. Rod, how, how far would you go in, in pursuing the, the primary site and, and in doing some of this fancy imaging? I go very far. Um, I think that not too long ago, one neuroendocrine tumor was treated quite like another. But now the difference between a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor and a carcinoid really matters. Uh, we have targeted agents that are FDA approved for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. We, they are not yet approved uh, for carcinoids. Uh, the chemotherapy response rates are very different for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So uh, I just published on this. We t I had 63 patients that came in with metastatic disease at diagnosis, and those 63 patients had 177 CAT scans, MRIs, upper GIs, lower GIs, capsule videographies, looking for their primary. 6% were positive, that were true positives, uh, almost equaled by the false positives. And I operated on all of them, and I found the primary tumor 80% of the time. So I will, before I put the patient through an operation, I will get a good endoscopic ultrasound because if there's a tumor in the pancreas that we can find that way, that will spare them an operation. But other than that, we, uh, we found 80% of those tumors laparoscopically. And uh, whether we resect it or not depends on a lot of their issues and is a completely different question. But I think it's very important to give the patient the answer, is this a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor that's eligible for certain types of treatments or a carcinoid that would be different, eligible for different type, uh, a completely different set of treatments. And we all have trials that we are enrolling patients in, and uh, we need to know which primary site we're dealing with to put them in the correct trial. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that as, you know, five years ago, my answer would have been different. Like Rod said, I would have said, ah, it doesn't matter as much, and I'd look, but I wouldn't look really hard. And I think that now our trials and the eligibility are so specific that we need to look hard. You really I agree. need to know. Yeah. Rod, in, in your study, uh, in the patients who came in with an unknown primary, what proportion had pancreatic and what had carcinoid? The, uh, well, obviously, if I found an endos uh, a primary tumor by endoscopic ultrasound, they didn't, they didn't end up in this series because we did find it. Um, I only found, out of the 63 patients, I only found two pancreatic 
primary tumor is that were not found by other means. They're, I think they're, easy, they're more amenable to being detected by CT, MRI, and um, endoscopic ultrasound, and all the rest were carcinoids. It's an interesting point, though, that with the changes in therapies now, endoscopic ultrasound might be something that we really weren't thinking about before, but is probably increasingly important so that we do treat these patients in the right way. Indeed. And the beauty of it is that all the patients in whom we didn't find a primary, we didn't really set them back. They all went home the same day with a Band-Aid on their belly button.